Welcome everyone. I am here to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Peter Sapelsa. He is speaking um, on the plague in Europe, 1898 to World War II, uh, wellspring of the global war on rats. I just want to introduce you to his background. He holds a BA in philosophy from Oberlin College and a PhD in history from the University of Michigan. He works in the fields of urban history, environmental history, and the history of technology, informed by attention to theory, method, and interdisciplinary approaches. His research includes um, urban infrastructure, envirotech, the Anthropocene, animal studies, mobility studies, and public health in modern European and global histories. He was a formerly managing editor of Technology and Culture from 2010 to 2020, and is a co-editor with Suzanne Moon of History of Technology Critical Readings of four volumes. At the University of Oklahoma, he teaches courses in media history, environmental history, history of technology, and social and ethical is issues in STEM. He is also a faculty affiliate in the Environmental Studies Program and a member of the faculty work group around the blog called Inhabiting the Anthropocene. His personal interests include bikes, cats, hikes, music, and travel, although I think we should talk more about rats on this talk. So welcome, everyone. If you do have a question for the talk, please um, post it in the Q&A and um, or you can use the chat. If you, Again, this is a, a webinar. We're all used to Zoom at this point, but we also know that there are technical issues. If you have technical issues, just reach out to somebody in the chat. And so hopefully we can address them. Um, and again, I'm looking forward to this conversation. All right. Um, let me work on sharing my screen while I thank uh, Connor Neal for technical support, Janet Ward for the invitation to talk, and finally Darcy for that really nice introduction. All right, if everyone can see my screen now, I'm happy to start. So in this talk, I want to trace the intellectual origins of a public health campaign that I call the Global War on Rats. In the half century after 1898, during the third pandemic of bubonic plague, Europeans reported about 1,700 cases and over 450 deaths. Now that was a tiny fraction of the 15 million deaths worldwide, with 12 million of them in British colonial India. While the first and second pandemics, known as Justinian's Plague and the Black Death, displayed uniformly high mortality rates across Eurasia, Many historians have stressed that this third pandemic had globally lopsided mortality, which struck the poor world much more heavily than the rich world. Buoyed by capitalism, imperialism, globalization, and the rapid mobility of railways and steamships, the world economy created this third plague pandemic by shipping infected rats, fleas, and people around the world to vulnerable colonial port cities where serious outbreaks resulted. Um, meanwhile, Europeans in imperial capitals were trying to explain this lopsided mortality, but also to soothe their particular fear that they were no longer safe from or perhaps immune to plague. These European attempts to soothe and explain, I argue, were the wellspring of the global war on rats. Um, this campaign was ill-conceived and the war was ultimately a loss which is precisely why I trace its history in my larger ongoing research project called Losing the Global War on Rats. All right, in October of 1898, news broke that six people in Vienna, Austria were sick and three later died from the plague in its deadly pneumonic form. The disease had spared Europe since Marseille and Moscow in the 1700s and Europeans had grown used to feeling safe from plague. In 1898, plague was raging in colonial India where scientific missions from across Europe went to study the bacterium, its transmission pathways, and possible vaccines. Paul-Louis Simond from Francis Pasteur Institute was there when he identified rats and their fleas as the biological vectors of this zoonotic or human-animal disease. The Habsburg Empire also joined the race to study plague, and Vienna's Pathology Institute hosted experiments on bacteria gathered in India and shipped to Austria. Uh, patient zero was this man, Franz Barish, 
The lab's deaner, which English sources translate variously as assistant, attendant, janitor, or servant, who took care of the rats that leading Habsburg pathologists injected with plague. Barish infected the two nurses who treated him and then Dr. Muller, assistant to the lab's director, who was Hermann Nothnagel, known for pathology, pharmacology, and neurology, who luckily did not get sick. So though the laboratory setting and its diligent staff kept the disease contained through extraordinary effort, both the press and the public in Vienna seethed in what journalists called a panic or terror. The capital's then aggressive anti-Semitic press scapegoated Jewish doctors for the plague, and officials feared that they would start a pogrom in the streets. Officials increased security around the Pathology Institute and removed all markers from the plague victims' graves. Luckily, no violence occurred. So the German psychiatrist Richard Kraft von Ebing, uh, for, uh, sorry, Richard von Kraft Ebing had worked in Vienna for almost a decade. And that fall, he lectured publicly to calm everyone's nerves. His talk, The History of Plague in Vienna, ended with the current outbreak. Although the people of Vienna were rightfully upset, he also noted that all of Europe was watching. The Anglophone press certainly watched, and one French doctor claimed, quote, the world is under the spell of a, of a profound emotion. The previous year, uh, Pasteur Institute Dr. Emile Roux pitched a scheme for the defense of Europe against plague to world leaders at Venice's International Sanitary Conference. Now, Roux shared with Kraftebing a sense of plague's continental significance. Similarly, the German pathologist Robert Koch had said that Hamburg's catastrophic 1892 cholera made him, quote, forget that I am in Europe. For these influential scientists, Europeanness was a bulwark against disease, but it was an uneasy one, which demanded defending Europe from disease. And this unease raised some scientific questions. Was it European biology or race, European social habits or living standards, or even its cool climate that made it plague resistant? And just how resistant was it? Um, Foreign observers scrutinized lab worker behavior, uh, bringing it back to Franz Barish. The French journal Annals of Public Hygiene diagnosed widespread problems with lab assistants, their excessive role, their overconfidence, their negligence, um, and their errors rooted in what they called insufficiently cultivated spirits. Barish was scapegoated as the weakest link in the Institute's safety protocols. One doctor claimed he bit his nails and smoked in the lab, proving his carelessness and scientific ignorance. The British Medical Journal noted his drunken debauch the night before his exposure. The New York Times noted that his widow says that familiarity with danger made him careless. And US medical journals brought Vienna's outbreak to bear on bacteriology's fate as a young science. One worried that opponents of bacteriology would use the outbreak to undermine laboratories. Another used it to argue for stricter regulation of laboratories. So although the foreign press rejected the anti-Semitism and scapegoating of doctors, journalists on both sides of the Atlantic blamed Barish for moral and hygienic laxity, performing the elitist ritual of blaming the help. Although Vienna's plague stayed contained both biologically and politically, creating neither an epidemic nor a riot, plague soon struck Europe again. Now, the next strike was not a lab outbreak, but at large in Oporto, Portugal. Plague had spared Portugal for over three centuries, but now it struck the nation's poorest region with Europe's second highest mortality rate. Cases clustered in the oldest and poorest neighborhoods near the Douro River. Official reports list over 300 cases and over 100 deaths, though historians have shown that over 800 excess deaths that year indicate serious underreporting. One Portuguese newspaper commented, quote, it is a great pity that plague's invasion of Europe now taking place in Portugal is in harmony with the image of our country among the civilized peoples. American, British, French, and Spanish newspapers were watching. Uh, Madrid's La Epoca diagnosed a profound sensation, while London's Daily Mail detected considerable alarm. Paris's Le Temps was op optimistic that the Pasteur Institute's plague serum, 
could protect France, but it also feared the blow to national interest if the coming 1900 Universal Exposition, which invited the world to Paris, was terribly compromised, as they put it, by plague. Reporting on Oporto, the Spanish pathologist Verdes Montenegro noted that, quote, medical men throughout Europe were also watching. Although American, British, German, Norwegian, and Russian teams arrived in Portugal, doctors from nearby Spain and France were most conspicuous. Dr. Albert Calmet, seen here, who led the Pasteur Institute mission to Oporto, wrote, in effect, we were accustomed for a long time to think of plague as a historical malady, so to speak, like a malady that once raged in the Middle Ages, in ancient times, but which had become incompatible with civilization and modern hygiene. Well, this illusion, we should lose it. Calmet's call to face plague in Europe captured the sober mood of his professional peers. He also demanded new plague controls, urging readers to make war before the pandemic on rats and mice. Specifically, he advocated methodical destruction of rats and mice with a prohibition on touching the cadavers of these animals with one's hands. He wrote, as much as possible, sewers, shops, and apartments should be disinfected, and the cadavers of rats should be grasped with metal tongs and incinerated or plunged in sulfuric acid. The Scottish medical scientist Patrick Manson addressed new students at the London School of Tropical Medicine that year, referencing Oporto, he said, with plague knocking at the doors of Europe, people should kill every rat. Now, watching Oporto's outbreak and heeding these calls, other European ports expanded their rat control. Copenhagen declared war on rats under the visionary leadership of this man, civil engineer Emil Zuschlag, who started a national society for destruction of rats and a public bounty hunt which yielded over 100,000 rats in the fall of 1899. Zuschlag later advised officials in Austria, Germany, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. German cities, including Altona, Hamburg, and Bremen, also waged rat war that fall, opening public bounty hunts, but with disappointing results. Even after this relative failure, the German government installed official rat catchers on the docks in Hamburg. By 1900, therefore, the rat war promoted by men like Calmet, Manson, and Suschlag was slowly taking shape, and plague spared the Paris Exposition, even in a very active plague year. It did not, however, spare Glasgow, Scotland, bringing 36 cases and 16 deaths. As in Oporto, cases grouped near the river, here on the south bank of the River Clyde, as seen in this municipal map. It was plague's first breach of Great Britain since the Great Plague of 1665. Newspaper The Guardian confirmed the shock, writing, the prevailing feeling of the average Englishman has been that however much this disease might ravage other parts of the globe, it had nothing more than a historical or philanthropic interest in his own country, except insofar as it interfered with commerce. The British Medical Journal provided extensive coverage, noting six cases of plague on ships at London's docks in recent months, which all stayed quarantined at port. By contrast, they called Glasgow's outbreak a calamity which has very wide bearings. This city rarely docked ships from plague ports like uh, Hong Kong or Mumbai, but received six million tons of cargo annually from Atlantic ships. Plague's arrival without any traceable contacts with infected ports was, as the editors put it, all the more alarming, especially in a port that lacked a chief medical officer. Scottish investigators found no mass death of rats and no direct human to rat contact, and yet they captured, killed, and examined many rats to monitor plague, and they urged citizens to turn in captured rats. Uh, in June of the following year, the Japanese bacteriologist, Dr. Nashandi, hinted to Scientific American that, quote, a league against the rat may be formed. Months later, Tsushlag in Copenhagen hosted the first international exposition of rat traps and engines for destroying rats to promote poisons, traps, and fumigation devices. At this gathering of rat warriors, Zuschlag pitched the idea of an international association for the rational destruction of rats and similar calls for an international association or league against the rat rang out in the coming years. 
Now, while Northern European ports were opening new rat wars, Mediterranean ports were at risk too, especially Marseille and Naples. In a medical thesis under Emile Roux, the French researcher Joseph Pellissier found seven ships with 38 cases of plague at Marseille in 15 months from 1900 to 1901. One steamship called the Senegal uh, was hired by the French science journal editor Louis Olivier for a Mediterranean study tour that September. Among 174 passengers were 18 doctors and prominent priests, painters, and professors, including the future French president, Raymond Poincaré. They left Marseille on the 14th, and they soon reached Ajaccio, Corsica, to tour Napoleon's birthplace, where they learned that a crew member with plague had to disembark. On the 18th, the ship docked at the Lazaretto, or quarantine station, on the Friul Islands offshore of Marseille, where passengers and crew disembarked for a full quarantine. They were the second ship isolated there after the Laos, a steamer from China and Japan, stopped in July with 17 plague cases and five deaths. Now, like London's recent cases, Marseille's cases stayed at port, though 38 cases in only 15 months was still worrisome. Weeks later, plague revisited Glasgow infecting four staff of the Central Station Hotel, and though the outbreak did not spread any further, its news echoed across the British world and the Atlantic in newspapers from India and New York to Mexico and Belize. Now, Naples, Italy was the worst hit in 1901, with 26 cases and eight deaths, once again near the port. Like Oporto in Portugal, Naples was known for poverty and overcrowding with a high death rate among comparable European cities. The outbreak centered on the state warehouses at Punto Franco, where Italian authorities offered extra hazard pay for workers to inspect and disinfect buildings and the cargo inside. U.S. public health service officials worried that heavy Italian immigration to New York arrived on ships from Naples that stopped in Marseille, and they watched the 1901 plague scares play out simultaneously in both cities as they monitored immigrants bound for New York. Within a year, the U.S. Marine Hospital Service inspected 199 ships and over 147,000 people at Naples and Palermo. They disinfected almost 200,000 pieces of baggage. They vaccinated all passengers from Naples and, as they said, most passengers from Palermo with plague serum from the Pasteur Institute. Now, Dr. Andrea Zino of the Naples Municipal Laboratory suspected that plague had been present for months, perhaps since May rather than September. He wrote, quote, there were other cases during this time, but we in Naples then lived in complete ignorance of this exotic malady. He had no clinical evidence of plague's presence before September, which meant he had no blood samples from infected humans or rats. But because Naples' human outbreak followed a mass death of rats on the docks, dock workers had been diligent in collecting dead rats for analysis. Sadly, Zinno noted, workers used their bare hands. What's more, almost everyone infected in Naples shared a chain of contact. They worked unloading sacks of wheat from ships, which exposed them to rats, and they worked in the Southern Italian custom in bare feet, which exposed them to flea bites. Now the Naples Rat War gradually became a permanent sanitary service that combed the city's port, catacombs, and sewers. Rat catchers were subject to uh, regular medical exams. They carried a rag soaked in disinfectant and a spear for skewering rats at a distance. Captured rats were drowned in sulfuric acid solution, examined for plague, and finally incinerated. So Naples' rat war reveals the delicate balance between securing rats for studying disease and destroying rat corpses for controlling disease. Infected rats were dangerous but valuable data. Zeno's laments about bare hands and bare feet echo previous elite judgments about worker behavior, morality, knowledge, and skill that were made in Vienna and in Oporto. Scapegoating workers for plague reached across Europe, and tellingly, the Rat War's loudest advocates very rarely fought in its trenches. <laughs>
the 1901 outbreaks in Glasgow, Naples, and Marseille made clear that European plague was neither anomalous in Oporto nor easily contained elsewhere. Calls were growing for scaling up, coordinating, and synchronizing the rat wars of uh, various ports, creating an international movement against rats. Health experts built this movement at the 1902 International Marine Congress in Copenhagen, the 1903 International Congress of Hygiene and Demography in Brussels, and the 1903 International Sanitary Conference in Paris. Although attendees at these conferences argued technically about weapons, considering germ agents, gas agents, poisons, traps, and animal predators, the war against rats itself enjoyed nearly universal agreement. At these meetings, Zuschlag promoted his new book-length study of rat destruction as the world's guide to rat war, and more high-profile uh, studies of rats and plague were in progress. In his 1905 study, A Treatise on Plague, the British hygienist and tropical medicine expert W.J. Simpson, here in the center, um, seasoned in rat war in Calcutta and the Cape Colony, offered a new reason that European plague was significant. He noted that plague's impact varied along racial lines and discussed a natural immunity or predisposition among Europeans. So here was a new and supposedly biological twist on Europeanness as a defense against plague. Simpson considered that this, quote, greater resistance of the white might be socially and not biologically determined but he also questioned how long it would continue once the microbe adapts itself to European conditions. For Simpson, as for many before him, Europe was both a defense against plague and in need of defense against plague. He exhibited those familiar tensions of anxiety and arrogance that characterized European elites throughout this age of empire. In 1907, the Danish king signed into law the anti-rat program led by Zuschlag since 1898. And within two years, Danish ratters caught more than a million and a half rats, excluding those destroyed by the government. Zuschlag also campaigned for an international organization drawing 2,000 members and interest from the governments of Germany, Russia, and Japan. The British rat researcher W.R. Bolter claimed in London's Daily Mail that um, they should borrow Zuschlag's approach in an official British program. He wrote, it is supported by every health community, every scientific institution, every agricultural society, every bank, every shipping firm, and maritime insurance company in the country. By December of that year, the Daily Mail was an important venue for British rat warriors, cheering the ongoing rat combat on London's docks, tracking the movement of experts demanding an official rat war and running letters from supportive readers. The editors also admired Hamburg's rat killer warship, a floating fumigation rig, and they discussed the various merits of cats and other species as predators. In early 1908, the British scientists here, Sir James Crichton Brown, W.J. Simpson, and Patrick Manson, created Britain's National Society for the Extermination of Vermin, inspired by rat wars in India and Denmark. They sought to expand existing local anti-rat efforts like those on the London docks, where workers caught 186,000 rats in 1902 and a measured 5,000 each month in 1903. But when Crichton Brown and his allies soon proposed an anti-rat bill in parliament, they were, quote, laughed out of the House of Commons. Even so, W.R. Bolter's 1909 book, The Rat Problem, continued campaigning for a British national rat policy. So while Britain's national struggle played out, Zuschlag's International Association made world news, reaching American, British, French, Chinese, Japanese, and Australian publications, as well as colonial journals in Hawaii, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka. The New York Times reporter um, in Paris noted that France, England, India, Japan, and New Zealand had pledged official support. Albert Calmet, always enthusiastic, cheered the rat war with pointed rhetoric writing, it is time to commit ourselves among humans against rodent kind to oppose our intelligence to their ruse, our force to their number, and our methods of scientific struggle against their guerrilla procedures. 
The global wave of enthusiasm for rat war made Britain's failed 1908 anti-rat bill look ironic, but it was doubly ironic because plague was sneaking back into Britain via the Orwell River. In the fall of 1910, plague reached Suffolk on the Shotley Peninsula downstream from Ipswich. Investigators were surprised to discover several previous unreported plague cases in the region since 1906, along with infected rats, but also a hare, a cat, and a ferret with plague. The Rural District Council spread leaflets urging farmers to kill rats without touching them and discouraging locals from eating rabbit or hare. W.J. Simpson reminded Britons to maintain their rat war, but he now softened his earlier racial view of plague resistance, contesting, as he put it, the general impression that plague could not possibly become endemic among Europeans. Paris Social Democratic paper Le Radical cheered Britain's crusade against rats, alleging that, quote, the massacre of rats is taking enormous proportions of 10,000 rats per day. Now, from July to October of 1911, the local government board and police of East Suffolk made a massive rat study, capturing and examining over 15,000 animals and finding 27 farms and other locations harboring plague infection. In all, Suffolk, England saw 22 cases from 1906 to 1918. Um, and though this new plague might, uh, plague scare rather, might have sped the struggle for an international or national rat law, the First World War emerged as a serious introduction, uh, interruption. Now, stories of trench rats on the Western Front are legendary. Here we see two German soldiers um, with their kill. But it was in the war's aftermath, amid the chaos of reconstruction, refugees, and the Spanish flu pandemic, that plague thrived and global rat warriors made one final push. In 1919, Britain finally got its National Rats and Mice Destruction Bill, which began two decades of British National Rat Weeks each fall, which mobilized the public in routine preventative rat catching. In 1920, Zuschlag reported from Danish bounty hunt receipts that 7 million rats were paid for since 1907's national rat law. But at the same time, plague also invaded Europe again, spattering Paris and Lisbon with around 100 cases each. Plague in Paris, home to the Pasteur Institute, was an embarrassment. The municipal council budgeted 500,000 francs for rat war in 1920 and 21, opening a rat lab and a public bounty hunt at 25 and later 30 centimes per rat, netting over 650,000 rodents. Paris also reformed trash collection with um, 300 motorized garbage trucks and restricted pickup times. Um, you can see one of those, uh, some Paris garbage pickup here. Um, this reform drew organized protest from almost 5,000 rag pickers who could not collect and sort refuse unless trash bins stayed outside overnight. While the municipal council partly met their demands, the public widely scapegoated them for what slang in Paris called the rag pickers plague. But the scapegoating did not stop there. Paris newspaper editor, editor Louis Forrest wrote, rats are as difficult to conquer as the Germans, linking rat war and human war. But he really blamed uh, refugees from Eastern, European, uh, Eastern Europe, many of them Jewish, for plague, writing, quote, these migrations of rats coming from the East are comparable to those of the humans who often accompany them. Biologist Henri Varigny was even, uh, even more nasty, sneering at what he called lice and flea-infested human vermin of Eastern Europe who were essentially undesirable physically and morally. Other sources similarly scapegoated Black Africans, leftist activists, British merchants, Muslim pilgrims, and any other human group that they often called rats. Amid this chorus of dehumanizing and discriminatory rhetoric, some experts spoke out against scapegoating. So for example, the progressive journalist Senator Paul Strauss, the Pasteurian Emil Roux, who we've already met, and the national hygiene minister, Jules-Louis Breton. So, um, the leading socialist feminist in Paris, Fanny Clark, 
defended refugees, rag pickers, and rats, claiming that rats were the victims of human cruelty. So um, through 1929, plague continually stopped Paris's city limits, adding another 30 cases. By 1937, British and French scientists would total 138 cases in Paris in the past 20 years. Local demand for rat war remained strong. So de-ratting requests to the Paris police and investigations from the city's rat lab grew from about 30 each in 1922 to many hundreds in the mid 1930s. Over the same period, Marseille saw an equal number of cases pushing France's national total in the interwar era over 250 confirmed infections. Uh, France was not the only European nation infected after World War I. The year 1920 saw the biggest spike in plague infections since its invasion of Europe two decades before, and though infection rates remained moderate throughout the 1920s, the international campaign against rats had already begun to fade. But trying to keep the global war on rats alive, Paris experts hosted two international conferences on rats and plague in 1928 and 1931. But scientific problems overwhelmed them. First, rodent ecologists disagreed about estimating rat populations. With no baseline rat count, even the enormous rat body counts we've seen today might be a fraction of all rats. Secondly, scientists learned that many mammals carry plague, not only rodents, not only rats, and certainly not only the very hated brown rat. In 1955, the Pasteurian George Girard counted 186 species of rodent that carry plague. Now, finally, um, were the rat wars human risks, including rat bites, sewer gas explosions or asphyxiations, gunshot wounds, rat poison, fumigation gas, harsh disinfectants, catching plague, or getting sick or injured by an experimental or a contaminated vaccine? For these reasons, offensive rat war gave way in the interwar years to defensive rat proofing. Terms like eradication, destruction, and repression were replaced with the less violent term rat control, following a much broader historical shift from the language of extermination to one of pest control. By the time of World War II, the global war on rats was lost, and developing sciences of rats and plague showed why it was unwinnable. Too many rats, too many other carriers, and too many risks to people. As scientific justifications for rat war faded, scapegoating and dehumanization did not. As both allied and Axis powers represented their opponents in World War II as rats to be exterminated. Um, with the world divided by human war, the global war on rats ended as rat control receded into its former local contexts, no longer emergency, but now just routine. After World War II, the pandemic quickly declined as antibiotics neutralized the plague and fleas dropped dead from the new pesticide DDT. In the process, the long running dialogue on European biological and social resistance to plague also died out. But for half a century, it had not only inspired the global war on rats, but also given Europeans ways to articulate their identities and their social prejudices. So while rat wars tended to focus on non-humans, rats, fleas, germs, warehouses, and ships, I have sought to bring forward the human aspects of this story in keeping with the mission of this lecture series. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. So... We do have time for questions. Um, and I would like to start us off first by talking about thinking, uh, you draw this really nice parallel of um, the rise of xenophobia, the, the connection of colonialism and the eradication of rats or the war on rats. Um, and so I think that one of the questions is thinking about like how, what is the idea of the concept of vector. This is something that I sort of written out and I've shared some conversation with you about this. So 
how can we understand vectors not only biologically but also socially in terms of relationships culturally or symbolically in terms of meanings or technologically like in terms of practices like shipping or modes of production which is something that you connect um the rise of the plague or the the you know the repeated rises of the plague with like the the system of trade the global system of trade in which i think we can all draw connections to with um the rise of airfare and the rapid global market into of, of industrialization so absolutely um so i i thank you for the question about vectors um Vet, so the modern concept of vector that we use today was not fully formed in this era, but you can see it coming. You can see it building. Um, and <clears throat> one of the problems here is the way that when you're reading documents written by scientists, they tend to treat as equal um, and, and sort of all reduced to a biological level vectors that are human, vectors that are non-human, vectors that are inanimate, vectors that are animal or insect. So you kind of get this weird sense that there's nothing wrong with throwing people into the same hopper as bugs and ships, um, yeah. and then rats, of course. And um, what I want to bring out is the way that this seemingly scientific argument for why we need to control pests is um, sort of hiding a bunch of human prejudices that we wouldn't want to defend. And I don't think a lot of scientists, even in this era, would have wanted to defend, at least not publicly. Um, so while there were a few voices, for example, those journalists in Paris in the 1920s who said really, really nasty things about refugees, about immigrants, about French colonial subjects, and about people of color, um, there were also those who said, look, this is really about controlling plague. It's not, let's not let it slide over into controlling people in that way. Um, and I think all of this is very, very familiar to us amid the COVID-19 pandemic as we think about, um, you know, the scapegoating that we've seen of, um, you know, whether it's lab doctors who may, you know, who allegedly created the plague, whether it's scapegoating of the nation of China or people of Chinese ethnicity, whether it's um, scapegoating of folks who are sort of uh, undereducated in public health or hygiene measures and are judged for their lack of knowledge. There are lots and lots of ways that we scapegoat people. And what's, what's most troubling about the pattern of scapegoating to me and what it really says about the social character of vectors um, is that it's, it's almost always victim blaming, mm -hmm. right? In other words, the scapegoating is always holding somebody responsible for plague who's probably really vulnerable to plague. And uh, that even includes the rats, right? By the end of this period that I'm talking about, you can tell that the rats are in fact biological scapegoats because there are plenty of other critters that carry plague and we don't have to get it from rats. Um, and so uh, even the rats are sort of being unfairly blamed in many ways. And I find that really interesting. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I also, I wonder if you, so you stop short of um, the rise of fascism, really, it seems like. And I wonder if you, you can maybe, I mean, this might be another topic in a different part of the book that you're writing, yeah. but I would love to hear about that. Um, in particular, how the idea of plague was used to, um, to promote Nazi propaganda or fascist propaganda in this nationalist state? Um, Nazi propaganda is the most uh, obvious and the most flagrant in that case, right? Because they have such famous images that depict Jews as rats. Yeah. Um, and they even worked very hard, right? The Nazi concept of the racial state worked very, very hard to sort of biologize social differences and to say, you know, we're not against these people because they practice the Jewish religion. We fear them because they're disease mongers, right? Interestingly, that recycles the older anti-Semitism that starts my story in Vienna in 1898, but now sort of weaponizes it as official government and fascist policy. Um, the other thing that the Nazis did was they adapted many weapons that were designed in the rat war as the weapons of the Holocaust, right? And so it was quite notorious that, um, you know, Zyklon B, the gas used to gas so many innocent people in the Holocaust was previously designed as a, as a pest control device. Mm 
-hmm. right? And so we really are seeing like not only a metaphorical casting under fascism of, you know, just of sort of hated groups as rats or as biological dangers, we're also seeing some very literal and technical connections between those who developed pest control for pests and those who then used those pest control weapons against people. Hmm. And the materialities of the of the atrocities seem to reflect the materialities of the, the ways in which extermination or the war on rat was rats were really um, operating in on the ground it sounds like like with the incineration and the like and the kind of like orderly kind of like counting of things as well absolutely you you you, you might say that the holocaust was in a way a really scary parody of the war on rats yeah um i also wanted to just like talk to you about like the the global it sounds like you're saying you're presenting the global war on rats as ill-conceived so what irrational or ideological aspects shaped this public health campaign um that's a that's a one of my favorite questions about this material um i so one thing that's irrational is the focus on the brown rat Right. Um, given that there are 185 other kinds of rodent, even not to mention the cats and ferrets and other critters that I mentioned in my talk, um, who can carry plague. Um, one of the things is that the, the war on rats was really singularly focused on killing brown rats in in ways that, um, you know, look like going off on a tangent in a sense. They're irrational because their focus is so singular. And then they're, they're therefore missing a bunch of other things that yeah. could very effectively control plague. Um, the, I guess another aspect of it is that that draws on, you know, centuries of imagery in the Western tradition that makes rats into enemies going all the way back to biblical times. And so I think there's this, you know, rats carry a very heavy cultural baggage into this war on rats that <clears throat> is every bit as effective as any of the more objective seeming rat science that I'm talking about. Um, every one of these rat scientists was deeply steeped in that longstanding cultural hatred of, of rats. I would love for you to talk more too about the cultural hatred, but then also so we have the rats, the Norwegian rats in particular, the brown rats, are also the ones we use in lab science. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that weird parallel, because we have a paradox, right, where they become these model organisms that stand for humans, but then we also have this idea where they uh, stand for, like they're kind of the scapegoat for human disease and so become, de they're dehumanized in some ways, right? So it's interesting that there's like, both they're human enough to, to be experimented on and test things on, but then when did that happen in light of this kind of plague uh, war on rats? So that, that's a little bit hard to date, but I think it's a really interesting, a really excellent question. Um, I've been, so I've been thinking throughout this research project, which is only about three years old at this point, that <clears throat> um, the war on rats was in fact a major contributor to making rats such ubiquitous scientific lab animals. Um, but I can't, justify that very deeply yet until I answer some further questions. And, and that's this, the, the war on rats did do a ton of rat research, right? Rodent ecology, rodent behavior, rodent biology and pathology, um, just plain rodent surveillance, dissection, all kinds of stuff. And so it did familiarize lab techs and lab scientists with how to use rats and how to handle rats. Um, however, if you're surveilling for plague, the rats you need are wild rats, right? right? Because you need to know how much is out there ecologically. And as a result, um, I need to do more to try and document how people who gained experience working with wild rats, maybe then later in their career worked with domestic rats, right? And so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe as the... Um, war on rats in its global form comes to an end, right, 1940s and 50s, you may see people who previously worked in these uh, rat labs going to work in other kinds of medical labs where their rat experience is a benefit. <clears throat> I can't document a case of that yet, but I, I suspect it's out there and I'd be really interested to find it. So here's hoping I do.
Yeah, I hope you do. That sounds like a really interesting little thesis thinking about how did lab, how do lab rats become lab rats? And maybe it's through this war on rats. And um, we have also a question from Connor. Um, how do you think the war on rats affected public perception of the concept of a pandemic or outbreak outside of zoonic disease? And how did the war on rats have an effect on the early response or view of the Spanish flu epidemic? Uh, this is really interesting because the so because the two pandemics overlap, right? right. Um, and what's more, they not only overlap in time, so they're happening in the same places at the same time, but they have, if, if you get plague in its pneumonic or lung involved form, which basically causes you know, horrible pneumonia, those are also the complications of getting influenza in 1919. And as a result, um, with giant numbers of plague deaths and flu deaths, um, hitting the world between about 1918 and 1921, um, it seems to me like many of these cases might have been uncounted or miscounted. We may not know all of which individual cases were plague or which were uh, flu, because if all we know is that you have a high fever and you're coughing up blood, that doesn't distinguish between the Spanish flu and the and the Black Death, right? And so. Um, it's a, it's a hard problem. Um, I will say this, that the war on rats did feed um, various public health responses to the, the Spanish flu. For example, um, the Spanish flu became very popular um, during the coronavirus pandemic as the latest, greatest example of like the big debut of cloth face masks, right? Mm -hmm. And although it was one of the world's largest and earliest applications of you know, facial protection, that technique was in fact uh, pioneered by Chinese plague scientists in Manchuria in 1910 and 11, who were responding to a massive outbreak of the plague there. And so um, it's, it's interesting that uh, just as the weapons of rat war could move from one context to another, so some of the tools of plague control that were invented you know, uh, in the trenches of the war on rats were later used to help control flu. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting connections here. For me, the, the cultural connections that you pointed to in your question, Connor, are the, the hardest to document. I have to do a lot of textual work and digging before I find those real connections. Um, but there are, on a, on a less symbolic and a more material level, many really obvious and easily documented connections between the two pandemics. So when we think about these um, these kinds of cultural understandings of pandemics, we think a lot about like the the brown rat as like being this irrational um, scapegoat, and how people sort of become they're like the scapegoating of vulnerable people also um, happen during what you the, the third plague pandemic um, with the of the brown rat. Do you see this happening today? Like um, any irrational responses to different <clears throat> Um, plagues or, vi or zoonic diseases today. I know that there's like this, there's a, the me MIT Media Lab is trying to eliminate or eradicate the mosquito. Yeah. Um, and so thinking about what, if this is also irrational or what ways in which, or, you know, just, I would love to hear your perspective on that and like bring up a historical comparison with, what, with your work on the rat, war on rats. Um, yeah, interestingly, although, you know, at the end of my talk, I suggested that the language of eradication has fallen out of favor because it's so violent and has so many problems. Um, interestingly, it hasn't completely gone away. And so this quest to maybe uh, engineer mosquitoes out of existence, usually through disrupting their reproduction, right, breeding new generations of sterile mosquitoes, right, has been the idea. Um, What's interesting about that is um, to me that it recycles that older idea of eradication as if there were never any massive symbolic and political problems with it back in the day. Um, but we should also, as I ended my talk, talking about the scientific reasons that the rat war failed, um, we should also think about what the material and biological or especially ecological outcome of getting rid of all these mosquitoes will be. Um, so far, the indications that I have from ecologists suggest that, you know, we're not worried about any specific, say, small mammal species going hungry because they can't eat mosquitoes anymore. 
right? Um, we probably don't know all the critters that do eat mosquitoes or exactly what, like what percentage of their diet they are. And so, you know, although you might not say, hey, bats are going to die off because all they eat is mosquitoes, um, yeah. that, that larger sense that by eradicating an entire kind of creature, you're disrupting a food web in a significant way. You're disrupting a whole ecology in a specific way. Um, you know, that could have lots of unpredictable effects. Um, I, I find that I'm um, thinking about rats and mosquitoes differently really um, reveals my own prejudices to me. That is, um, at, the more I do this research project, the less I fear and despise rats. And the more I think they're adorable, they're intelligent, um, they, you know, they can cause us a lot of problems, but um, I like rats more and more as I do this work. Um, I don't, however, find myself uh, feeling cozy about mosquitoes. I hate mosquitoes. <laughs> and so, um, interestingly, I think that that comparison, right, between the old war on rats and the new war on mosquitoes ha has a way of showing that, like, I'm not just in this research project to display past horrors of the history of medicine and past prejudices, right? It also helps me sort of work on my own prejudices and ask whether my own opinions still make sense, right? Given what I now know about rats and about um, how, how ugly these campaigns for eradicating entire species become. Well, it's interesting, right? Because you sort of think about the rise of the lab rat after the eradication, the idea of the eradication of pest. But now we have, but you're right, like the mosquito, nobody works on the mosquito. There aren't like a bunch of mosquitoes in, in a lab that we're using as model organisms for humans. Instead, we have this like the substitution for humans with like a rat and, and the brown rat at that. So there is a kind of more a different history, a different connotation to rats that competes now, rather than thinking about them as only vectors, but also as models, which is a new idea. If 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 what you're like if, to put it in context of your talk, it's like actually a concept that has emerged since the end of the global war on rats. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and um, it also reminds me that, of course, the meanings that different animal species have in human society really do change over time, which is what makes human animal history so interesting. And um, animals can come in and out of their status as desirable animals or pest animals. Um, today, interestingly, um, we basically have two-tracked the entire rat world into the, the wild ones that we hate and the domestic ones that we need and we appreciate, right? Um, mosquitoes, we haven't gotten there yet, right? Mosquitoes remain in the category of pest for most cultures. And, that, and that's not to say they couldn't change, right? Because many animals have. At a, at a very strange moment around 1900, horses, which had served people in cities faithfully for many, many centuries, suddenly appeared as undesirable in cities because of their hygienic issues. And then cities started cleaning out horses and stables and everything else. Um, you know, that, that was a real shift where horses had been some of the most beloved animals of the entire human uh, history until that point. And then all of a sudden they're not wanted in cities anymore. Um, other things happen, right? Pigeons used to be really loved domestic animals. Then as one sociologist recently put it, they became rats. They became right. pests, right? So um, I, I've been really fascinated by these changing meanings and, and uh, this project has really, as I said, changed the way I think about rats. Um, although I don't know if we're yet at a big turning point in how we think about mosquitoes. They're still pests and we're still <laughs> trying to destroy them. Yeah, it seems like a difficult uh, jump for a mosquito. Me, me too. I, I'm, I'm really convinced by the sort of um, cultural psychology that says, look, mammals are easy to love. They're cute. They're furry. We like that. Like culturally that works for us, but insects don't usually do that same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, so we have, uh, you know, a little bit more time. And so I guess like going off on thinking through animals and how actually their categories are contingent upon time and space. Um, which reminds me of my own work where we think about like the, like I work with um, people who work with landmine detection rats, but they use a very specific type of rat because it's yeah. cuter. And they said like, oh, this is cuter. That's why we use this one. Whereas a brown rat, even though it would be effective, they don't use it because it's um, less adorable. Um, so 
thinking through that, and this is something I think you have a lot to talk about, how does including animals in social research change the way that we understand um, being human or being in a society? Um, so, I mean, one of the interesting things that that uh, I've noticed in the secondary literature that I've that's inspired me um, is the idea that rat catching is really a multi-species endeavor. It's not just one species against another, right? It's not just humans going at rats, but it also involves a whole bunch of natural predators and or domestic animals that humans enroll to help in the war on rats. So the, the favorite one, the most beloved one is of course the rat terrier, like the Jack Russell terrier. Um, these animals are incredibly intelligent, incredibly agile. They're little and tube shaped so they can fit right into a rat burrow. Um, and they really are remarkably, like I think there you can definitely say we like working with ratting dogs because they're cute in part, just like your, your hero rats that you write about. Um, there's also, um, of course, other animals involved. So people tried snakes and mongooses and ferrets and cats and all kinds of uh, creatures to do away with rats. They even bred, right, both at the Pasteur Institute and many labs throughout Europe, they bred different um, versions of salmonella that they used as germ weapons against rats. There again, another living thing that we are enrolling to go against rats. The, the other thing that's interesting is that, so on that human side in the rat war, it, it turns out to be a multi-species endeavor, right? Also on the rat side of the rat war, the target turns out to be a multi-species endeavor because we're not really just talking about rats, but all the other critters that carry plague. And so uh, ground squirrels, prairie dogs, and marmots have been very, very influential in plague control throughout the years. Um, and of course, we're not just worried about those rodents, but also worried about the big ecology that is rodents and their fleas, how those rodents and fleas attach to human food storage and then expose people. So it, you know, putting animals back into these stories of social history um, really changes the way we see society in various ways. Yeah. And I think, and Tracy has like a related question about how the meaning of the rats then shape ideas about the people who are employed to control them. So like what happens to the pet, to the exterminators, like, in, and how do they reflect these ideas as well? Well, first of all, hi, Tracy, thanks for coming. And um, that is a really neat question. And it, it shows you that, you know, of all the um, blue collar skilled technicians that you might want to invite into your home to provide a service, um, you're usually not going to be really disgusted by or worried about the plumber or the carpenter, right? But for some reason, exterminators do have a little bit of stigma around them. And I think you can say that comes in part from their proximity to rats. I will also, I want to repeat the, the argument I made in the talk that um, scapegoating really works um, in, in part by blaming victims. And so oddly, all these uh, elite scientists who are arguing so, so aggressively for the war on rats, they don't have to set foot in the sewers. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do this work themselves. And so um, many of the other chapters in my book focus much more heavily on working class actors and on the hands-on fighters of rat war um, because the guys who invented this idea were not the ones who fought the battle, right? Just like the generals who declare war are not the ones who serve in the trenches. Um, and that difference really matters. Um, and so I find that uh, lots of working class people who get put in harm's way um, in the rat war, um, some of them by choice because they sign up to be exterminators, but others of them because they don't have any um, any choice. So for example, in many colonial cases, European imperialists would use prisoners to fight rat wars and make police oversee these gangs of ratting prisoners. Right. So it was like forced labor. Um, they were, because they knew that people did hate the rat and would probably not volunteer to go in the trenches of rat war, they forced vulnerable people to go in. Um, the, we, I talked many times today about bounty hunts. Well, bounty hunts offer really, really small amounts of money. And so they only attract very poor people. Um, and that means that there, there you're you know, targeting the poor. Um, one of Zuschlag's photographs shows all these Danish children showing up because they were hunting rats for pocket money, 
right? So you're talking about colonial subjects, the poor children, all these vulnerable groups getting put in harm's way. While, as you can see on this slide, the, the, the fancy men of European science have conferences where there aren't any rats. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that the, the social dynamics here are really interesting and really important to my project. And, and thanks, Tracy, for asking about them. Well, thank you so much. I think that was a great talk, and I'm really excited to read the book when it comes out. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>